Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. Uh, we're having a sermon and I uh, hope everybody's okay today. It's called The Trial of Your Faith. Uh, so if you'd like to come before the Lord and uh, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, in his name for your love and mercy that you have shown us. And dear Father, we pray that as this message is preached, we ask, Lord, that you would use it for thy glory and thy Holy Spirit would bless it. We ask the Holy Spirit to come now and to anoint this word. And, O oh God, we pray that thou will get the glory and we pray that you will bless this message and that, Father, you would seal it to all our hearts. May we know your grace and may we know your love today. May people be comforted and helped by this message. In your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. We're looking at uh, James chapter 1. Uh, in the book of James chapter 1 verse 1 to verse right about verse 4 James a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations consider it pure joy my brothers whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking in anything so thus the, what we're going to be doing especially uh, verse 3 and 4 I'll just uh, get my pocket New Testament so I can <laughs> look at that as well um, for easier um, reference okay so we're going to be looking at fiery trials one writer said as faith bows submissively it reaps profit and grows by the knowledge of him as faith bows submissively it reaps profit and grows by the knowledge of him and that's what we're going to be looking at today we're going to be looking at the nature of faith in the midst of trial one writer said all is under his hands and he has made us for his glory and whatever trials we go through we can say that that God has made us for his hands and he's made us for his glory a lot of people are under the false apprehension that if you become a Christian that everything's going to be fine but actually when you become a Christian the Bible warns us and teaches us that things will not be easy and we're going to be looking at that in more detail later first of all you can be joyful in trial James chapter 1 excuse me verse 2 we read consider it pure joy my brothers whenever you face trials of many kinds consider it pure joy um, sometimes we can live with no joy we can live uh, be, uh, with a lack of joy because of some kind of tragedy it might be a death it might be unemployment it might be um, some situation that's come in your life and it's as if someone's gone into your house and stolen all your goods and and it's as if someone's come into your life and stolen your joy and you can't be joyful anymore or it's like you are at night and you see the sun go down and you've seen your joy go down and unhappiness rise and you're still waiting for the sun to come up but it seems never to come up and you're in perpetual darkness and there's no joy well you can be joyful We'd be joyful by concentrating on the goodness of God. Philippians 4 verse 4 and 9. If we concentrate on our bitterness, on our anger, 
on the hurt that people have done us or on the difficulties of the situation that we're in then we'll only get more bitter and more angry and if we turn to Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 to 9 it says rejoice in the Lord always I will say it again rejoice this is a man in prison let your gentleness be heaven to all the Lord is near so there's the command to rejoice and then it says let your gentleness be evident to all in other words get rid of bitterness and anger do not be anxious about everything but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God in other words Paul saying look in your difficulty you have a good God who is going to answer your prayers and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus here it is finally brothers whatsoever is true whatsoever is noble whatsoever is right whatsoever is pure whatsoever is lovely whatsoever is admirable if any is excellent or praiseworthy think about such things whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me put in practice and the God of peace will be with you and the great strategy of the devil is to get you to look at your circumstances and to say that God is not with you that God does not care but you've got to think about the goodness of God you've got to think about the purity you've got to think about wholesome things in your life and as you think about wholesome things in your life joy will rise again take your mind off the negativity and put it on the positivity of the goodness of God you said Jay but my circumstances are difficult my problems are hard my problems are not going away Jay and my reply to you is turn your mind away from those problems and turn them to God and think about God and who he is and the goodness of God and the majesty of God and the glory of God think about God and you will get through and you'll get through with joy doesn't mean to say that we don't have sorrow Jesus wept at Lazarus grave but he had joy Paul had sorrow for all the churches but he had joy number two joy in our first section number one section one a b you will return joy will return as we do the will of God imagine it's a, a, a freezing cold Antarctic place so sorry no imagine we'll come to that illustration in a minute imagine it's snowing and the kids are playing out in the snow on the sledge but there's one child he's a five-year-old uh, blonde-haired uh, red-nosed kid and his mum says put your coats on you're going to get a you're going to get a cold and the little boy says no I don't want to and he won't put a coat on the next day he gets a terrible cold and he's lying in bed for two weeks the boy didn't do what the parent said so made it worse and you know sometimes when we're in a trial God wants us to do his thing but we say no I'll do it my way and we do it our way and we make it worse if you turn to Acts 16 22 Acts 16 22 It says the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten and after they had been severely flogged they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully upon receiving such orders. He put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them so Paul and Silas have been beaten and yet they were singing in prison they were praising God in prison and suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken 
And all at once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. And the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors, he was going to commit suicide. And Paul and Silas said no. And the Philippian jailer came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the point. In prison, Paul and Silas were joyful. Why were they joyful in prison when they'd been beaten? I tell you why. Because they believed that they were called by God to preach the gospel, and they were doing the will of God. And as they knew they were doing the will of God, they knew God was with them. And they knew God was with them. And if you do the will of God, you know that God is with you. You know that God is going to help you. No matter what comes against you. No matter if it's the whole nation comes against you. No matter if everybody is against you. If you are doing the will of God, God is with you. And if God is with you, you do not have to fear what men will say or what men will do to you. Do the will of God and God it will be with you. And that will give you joy to rise up in your heart. And then... Joy will return as we see God is in control. As we see God is in control. Joy will return as we think of the goodness of God. Joy will return as we see, seek the will of God. And joy will return as we see God is in control. If you look at a tapestry of a beautiful eagle, and it's a great big piece of cloth and someone has sewn tapestry a picture of a beautiful eagle flying in the sky and it's beautiful but if you look at the back of the tapestry it looks a mess it looks confusing but if you turn it round you see that beautiful picture of an eagle soaring and we look at our lives and we can only see the back of the tapestry. We see our lives and we think it's a mess. We think, why has this happened? Or why has that happened? Or why is this happening? And it just doesn't make sense. But we're looking at it from the back. We're not looking at our lives from God's perspective. That His wise hand is knitting together our lives in a plan. So that in the end, when we get to glory, we will see the full picture. And it will be a beautiful picture of how God has guided and helped us. Even when we fail. Even when we break down and fail ourselves. Even when we make mistakes. Your God will take the mistakes and weave them into his plan. Even when there are enemies who have come against you. God takes them and weaves them into his plan. So that you are in his plan. And it will have a purpose and meaning. And at this time, all you can see is desolation. Or confusion in your life. But you have to trust God has a plan. And he's working it out for your good. Romans 8.28 Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. And did you see that? And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purposes. He knows you love him. You said, Jay, I've been disobedient. Jay, I've made sin. I've, I've sinned. Jay, I've made mistakes. But he knows deep down you love him. He knows the trials and the difficulties and the hurts and pains that you have had. And he knows that you can't cope at times. It doesn't excuse your mistakes. But he knows he, you love him. It might only be a faint love. But he knows it. And as he knows it, all things work together for the good of them that love him. God is working all things in your life for his good. And for your, for your good. All your past mistakes, all your past sins. 
all your present hang-ups, all your present pain, all your present frustration, God is using it. All things work together for good to them that love God. All things. So lift your head up, my friend. Do not lie upon a pillow of tears, but lift your head because your God is working all things for your good today. You say, no, no, Jay, you can't be me. It can't be me, Jay. It's got to be him or her. God's working for her. Because look at her. She's doing okay. Or him. He's doing okay. It can't be me. God, God doesn't care about me, Jay. All things. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? And your Lord is working all things for you right this moment. In the midst of your pain, in the midst of your frustration, He is working all things for you. He is there for you. And though your circumstances are like a megaphone screaming, no one cares for me. No hope for me. And the pain and the tragedy screaming in a great megatone voice. Nobody cares. There is darkness in my life. There is no hope. In the midst of those stuck voices of screaming in your life of no hope and pain. That seems to be overwhelming and succumbs you is the still small voice of the loving Saviour who gives you his apostle who says to you in the midst of all this screaming and hurt and pain of this pain and suffering in your life I love you I love you and I'm with you and all things work together for them that love God and I am working in your life and I am guiding you in your life you can't see it at the present time but I love you and I am guiding you and I know you think it's hard and I know you think it's impossible and I know you think it's painful but I love you and all things work together are working together for you even you because you whether you think it or not are precious in my sight so keep looking to me all things and we see that work out in Genesis chapter 37 <coughs> Genesis 37 Genesis 37 Genesis 37 23 He says so when Joseph came to his brothers they stripped him of his robe of the richly ornamented robe he was wearing then they cast him off and sold him into slavery then if we turn to Genesis 39 verse 11 to 21 on the day he went into the house to attend his duties and none of the household servants was inside she called him by his cloak and said come to bed with me but he left the cloak in her hand and ran out of the house and Joseph was sold into slavery he ended up working for Potiphar and then Potiphar's wife accused him of rape and Potiphar threw him into prison again and in all that tragedy and pain in Genesis 45 when his own family had let him down Genesis 45 1 and 7 then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants and he cried out making everyone leave my present make everyone leave my presence so there was no one with Joseph when he 
made himself known to his brothers. These are the brothers that sold him into slavery. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him, because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. Come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling, for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. So his brothers did the dirt on him and sold him into slavery, but God had sent had used that to send Joseph ahead of his brothers to prepare prepare food for, for Egypt in the time of famine that would help Joseph's brothers as well. And God, as Joseph would say later, meant it for good. Imagine you've got a bowl of soup, you're cooking it on the fire, or on, on your cooker. It's got vegetables in, it's vegetable soup, and you're cooking it. The pan's boiling, and you see at the top of the pan, it's kind of like dark water. Then you get your big spoon, your spatula or your spoon. You put it in and you stir the soup. And then you can see all the vegetables come to the top. And it starts to bubble and throth. And you can see the vegetables and the goodness. That's what you need to do. At the moment, all you can see is darkness on the top of your life. You need to start stirring things up. You need to start stirring your mind and your heart up to think about the goodness of God. To think about the will of God. Stop doing your will, but do it. Do, do things God's way. Do, do it His way. And remember that, no matter what has happened to you, God is in control. God is in control. You're not powerless. God is in control and working it out for you. Number two, that was our first part of the message. I'll just get a drink, I've got another drink here, just be one second. The next part of the message is you can be sure you will have trials. Here's that illustration I was talking to you before. Imagine you imagine um, you're in the Antarctic and th there's a excuse me you decide to go for a swim crazy as it may sound and you've got your trunks on or your bikini and you jump into the Antarctic Sea and that first few seconds there's a massive shock oh it's freezing sometimes as Christians we can have a shock the trial can be so um, It could just take us by surprise and we're not ready to, to deal with it. And, it. and it shocks us. But in James chapter 1 verse 2 it says trials of many kinds. And, and we, have, we will have trials as believers of many kinds. And we see that in the Old Testament. If you look at the Old Testament, if we go to Hebrews chapter 11.32. And we see trials in the Old Testament. Hebrews 11:32. It says, "And 
What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, and the prophets who, through faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life, others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. So in the Old Testament the people of God suffered and had trial. Then we see our Lord Jesus uh, had trial. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews 5, verse 7 and 9. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions and loud cries and tears to the one whom would save him from death and he was heard because of his reverent submission although he was a son he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect he made the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him so our Lord had to suffer and went through uh, un unimaginable suffering um, and then if we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10 the apostles had trials and we read that in 2 Corinthians two Corinthians, chapter 6 verse 3 and 10 we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited rather as servants of God we command ourselves in every way in great endurance in troubles hardships and distress in beatings in prisons and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, in understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love. Uh, and then he goes on, in truthful speech and in power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing yet possessing everything. Excuse me. So the apostles, such as the apostle Paul, went through grievous trials. Now, we got to say this, that it is biblical Christianity to say that we will go through trials. There's this teaching in the church today, and in many churches, is called the prosperity gospel where they say everything's going to be great everything's going to be fine uh, and you just pray and you get what you want from God that's not true uh, the Bible New Testament Christianity teaches that you will go through trials if you don't believe me let's go to Matthew chapter 5 Matthew, sorry, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 and 12. It says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Verse 11, Blessed are you who people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So, the Lord Jesus Christ there is teaching that his disciples are going to be persecuted and if they are blessed people they are then if you turn to Romans 5 3 Romans 5 3 it says not only so but we also rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance so there it's teaching that we rejoice in suffering because suffering teaches us perseverance and so this is addressed to the whole church uh, of God. Then we turn to Acts chapter 14, 22. And so we're building a biblical picture of suffering. Acts 14, 22. 
think it's 14, sorry, Acts 14, 22. Strengthening the disciples and encourage them to remain true and to the faith, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. So Paul and Barnabas saying that we must go through many, many trials. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29. Philippians 1 29 For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for him. So it's categorical there that you not only believe on Christ we also suffer for him. And then Philippians 3.10 I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death. So Paul wanted to live like Christ which was a, a life of going to the cross and that's what the Christian life is, it's going to the cross, it's willing to die to self and that's, a, that's not easy, that's a trial. Then if you turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12 to 16 Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering. Don't be surprised as though something strange were happening to you but rejoice that you, you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. So, we've seen from the Old Testament, um, from the life of Jesus, from the Apostles, and from the Biblical teaching, that it's Biblical that as a Christian you will suffer. Okay? So don't get into this prosperity, health and wealth gospel that says you're going to have all healings. I believe God heals, but it's not going to be all the time. Um, not, God's not just going to make uh, a fantastic, happy life for you all the time. Sometimes you're going to have to go through difficulties. Okay. So... Be ready, you know. Be ready for the for the challenges. Uh, get yourself strong in the Lord. Listen to good Bible messages. Meet with the Lord's people, but be ready for the difficulties that will come your way. And then, thirdly and finally, uh, you can be sure trials have a purpose. We've looked at you can have trial. You can have joy in your trials. We've looked at you will have trials. And thirdly, you can be sure uh, your trials have a purpose. You know, life can be like, um, you know, you've had a shipwreck and there's a bit of a lifeboat and you're on the lifeboat and you're just drifting. You've been drifting for days and days and it just seems endless and endless. And sometimes life can be like that. Sometimes you can feel, I'm just drifting, I just don't see the point of it. It just seems pointless, it seems endless. James chapter 1 verse 3 says, Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking in anything. So in other words, sorry, I've just got a itchy nose. Um, so in other words, your trial is working perseverance in you. It's working in you. It's doing something in you. And that's why you're going through the trial. It's what God wants to do in your character, in your life, because he's preparing you for eternity. Okay? So let's look. Romans chapter 5. So your trial has a purpose. 
the drifting, the aimlessness in your life and you feel it's just pointless, you feel you're not getting anywhere, you feel you're just going round in a circle, you feel no one's bothering with you, no one cares, you're just feeling that it's just pointless. You know, I, I've heard people who want to commit suicide because they just can't see the point of it. And, and if you turn to Romans 5, Verse 1 to 5, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering. Why do we rejoice in our suffering? Because we know that suffering, what does suffering do? Produces perseverance. And what does perseverance do? character and character hope and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us but the point is that suffering brings perseverance which brings character which brings hope in other words God is doing something in your heart is 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 molding you is is developing your character there are things in your life that need to be dealt with one of them's pride one of the one of them's impatience and God has got to chip away chip away and break you down so that he can mold you into the person that he wants you to be and we don't like this breaking down we don't like our pride being dealt with we don't like uh, having to wait for, for answered prayer we, we don't like these things but God has got a bigger purpose in hand developing your character and so if you turn to Psalm 37 verse 7 37 verse 7 it says be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him do not fret when men succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes wait patiently God's got it in hand for your life other people might have moved on and be successful and you might seem to not be successful or whatever don't worry wait patiently God's got it in hand your time will come in his time God will bless you be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him do not fret when men succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes okay so God wants to develop your character he wants you to be patient and then he wants your submission to Corinthians 12.8 2 Corinthians 12.8 it says three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from him but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that, so that Christ's power may rest on me. But Paul pleaded with the Lord to take away this problem in his life three times. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And three times he pleaded, but in the end he had to submit to God's will. And sometimes we 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 plead with God and we plead with God and we plead with God and what it is is a battle of wills. What it is we've got self will. We're holding on to something. It might be pride that we we wanna we wanna be the top dog, and we plead with God to make us the top god dog. Or it might be we want a, a good job or a good salary or a good home or a wife or whatever and or children or or get rid of sickness and we plead and we plead and we're determined that God does it and we keep pleading and as we keep pleading we get bitter and we get angry and we get frustrated and the problem is that we're not submitting to God we don't pray and then say Lord thy will be done and that's what God wants us to do he wants us to get to that point where we say thy will be done okay God if you continue to lead me in this path thy will be done 
if you don't want me to be top dog, thy will be done. If you don't want me to have a husband or a wife or children, thy will be done. And there's got to be that submission and willingness to, to receive God's plan and God's purpose and God's will in the midst of that suffering and prayer. Okay? And, and, and a lot of our trials, uh, it's really God wanting us to learn submission in the trial. He wants to develop our character. He wants to develop patience. And he wants us to submit. And he's waiting for submission. Many, many people can't find peace in trials because they're so strong-willed. They will continually want to do it their way. They will continue want to sort things out in their way. They will try to bend God to do their will. And they can't seem to get out of the trial and they can't seem to get peace. And it's because they will not submit. It's because they will not give up and say, Lord, I give up. I give up my self-will. I want to do your will and I submit to you. And Paul had to submit. He had to submit in the trial. And as he submitted, he learned the next lesson, which is dependence. God wants you to change your character. He wants you to learn patience. He wants you to submit. But then he wants you to know dependence on him. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 again. So we read. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So the Apostle Paul, with the problem that he was having, and he pleaded three times to take it away and God wouldn't take it away. What that meant is Paul had to fall into the arms of God and ask for help and strength. He, 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 he learned to be dependent on God. You know, he just didn't have any strength anymore. Uh, and sometimes God, the, there is what I would call the fruit of a trial. God has to allow the fruit of a trial. What that means is, if you get a seed of an apple, uh, of, a, of a peach tree, and you plant the seed, it takes a long, long time for the tree to grow. But eventually when it's grown, there's a, there's a time of ripe fruit. Uh, there's, a, there's a time when the luscious fruit of the peach will come and it's at that right time you can pick the fruit and there is a fruit that there is a trial is like a fruit God's waiting for the fruit of the trial and that fruit is when the child of God realizes it's not about the trial nor about what you can get in your life whether it be fame, position, money, sex, relationship, whatever it's when you realize that that's not the main thing the main thing is your character that God wants to change your character when you realize that God wants to develop your patience when you realize that God wants you to learn submission and submit to him and when you, you realize that your resources have come to an end that you can't do it anymore that you have to depend on God completely that's when the full fruit has come and you're ripe for the picking 
God is well pleased. The trial has done its job. Okay. God is developing your character for eternity. And it seems very, very hard at this present time for you. But guess what? He knows what he's doing. So in conclusion then, don't panic. Don't think life is passing you by. Don't think things are out of control. Let us just look at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Verse 35 to 41. That day when evening came he said to his disciples. Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind they took him along. And just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. A furious quail came up. And the waves broke over the boat. So that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him. Teacher. Don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Be quiet, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Did you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Don't fear. Don't panic. The Lord is in control and the Lord knows what he's doing. All that's happened to you, whether it be by your own fault, your own mistakes, or whether people have been nasty or unkind to you, or whether you've just had a difficult uh, dealt of the cards of life, whatever it is, your Saviour holds everything in his hands and he is using it all to work his purpose out in your life, to change your character. To make you more patient, more submissive and more dependent on him. And in the end, God is with you and he's leading you and he has a plan and purpose for you. Don't put your head in the sand and pretend that God is going to make everything wonderful. Because God never promises that. But you can be assured that God is with you right now that there is a purpose in your suffering and pain right now that purpose is your character and developing you for eternity and you can have joy in the midst of sorrow and you can know that the Lord is good Philo, a Jewish scholar, he was not a Christian, had students in a seminary that he had. And he said there are three kinds of students in his classes. There are the beginners, there are those who are making progress, and there are those who are maturing. God's aim for your life is that you start to mature in your walk with him. So he's moving you on from beginner, from making progress, into maturity. And that's why you are going through, and have been going through, the trials in your life. Okay. Let's come before the Lord and pray. I'll just be quiet a moment and give you time to be quiet and then I'll pray. Lord, how often we have walked in darkness. How often have we have wept and wondered what it was all about. 
How many times have we lost hope? Feeling there is no hope. But Lord, we thank you for these words. That you show us that there is hope. That actually over the trials is a good God working his plans and purposes out. Who is in control. And a God who is developing our character so that we might rest and be patient and obedient to him. And so, Father, I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and for your glory that you would be with my dear brothers and sisters today, that each one of them would come to rest in you and wait patiently for the end of their trial. And, Father, we pray that they would know your comfort, especially today and each day. And we pray that in time their trial would be lifted and they would know the joy of your salvation and the victory of your joy and peace. We pray that this message would be used for your glory to be a blessing to many people. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be upon every word of this message and every heart that receives it. We ask above all that you would have the glory and the honour. For Lord, we are nothing. Lord, we are nothing. And we are dependent completely upon you. And we give you the praise and the glory. Father, Son and Holy Spirit and these three are one. Be with you all. Amen. Amen. Okay, I hope that was a blessing to you. Uh, please pray for me. I'm going to be busy now in the next few days in Manchester uh, preaching away uh, on the streets. So uh, be praying for me and uh, take care and God bless you all.